the 17th season of Bass Talk Live with your hosts, Mark Jeffries and Matt Pingrak. BTL is brought to you by Lorraine's Bass Cat Boats, Apco, Duck and Fishing, Strike King Lures, Sunline, Big Bite Baits, Spro, Exo Lures, Yamagatsu, The Bass Tank, and Denali Rods. PTL, coming at ya! Good Wednesday, everybody. Welcome once again to another edition of BTL Bass Talk Live, where Ken and I are going to talk bass fishing and anything else that we want to talk about. Ken, how you doing, man? I'm doing great, Mark, and I can't wait to hear your story about yesterday, which you've already <laughs> foreshadowed to me just a little bit. It's an exciting day, June 2nd. That's my wife's birthday. And it's nice. also 89th anniversary of George Perry's world record largemouth bass catch. So uh, lots going on today. All right. We will dive into that world record uh, chat here in a few minutes. Happy birthday to Mrs. Duke. And uh, I'm sure you have a big evening planned, right? Uh, my wife, is, uh, my wife is, is not a big believer in going out just yet. Okay. So she has not eaten in a restaurant in uh well over a year wow and uh convincing her to go out even on this wonderful occasion is not yeah. going to happen I'm, I'm hoping i can go pick something up for us <laughs> all right man sounds good uh dude yesterday folks for those out there listening uh i i, I have to tell this story real quick yesterday frank scalish was on when we started the show i run the show with let's see here one two three four with five monitors for some reason, there was this monitor right here was not working, and I couldn't figure out why it wasn't working. And I tried to pre-trip it and do everything you can before the show to get it to start running. Would not play. So I went yesterday's show without this monitor right here, which is kind of critical, but I limped through it, duct tape and crazy glue. That's how I get around sometimes, all right? So after the show... One of the first things that I do is I try to get the replay out as quickly as possible on BassOne.com and then make some modifications on YouTube and then put the podcast out. Well, I made the decision yesterday that I was going to dive into why this monitor wasn't working. So Frank's already gone. He's out of there. And I turn and I look and the monitor starts smoking. There's smoke coming out of the monitor because even though it was shut off and still plugged in, it would flicker every now and then. So I look over and right here, there's smoke that's coming. I have no idea. So I run around on the other side, unplug it real quick. And the next thing I know, this monitor goes down. Then the next thing I know, the big monitor goes down. I'm like, what the heck is going on? So... This is probably about 11 o'clock, okay? After going to seven stores, seven different stores, taking the, the, the tower computer back to the guy that built the thing for me, having him look at it, having him look at the monitors, it was 6 o'clock when I finally got the replay out there. But I'm up and running. I figured it out. I don't know why it happened. I have two brand new monitors here. I had some upgrade stuff take place in the tower. Thank goodness nothing was wrong with the big screen TV that I look at you right now, Ken. Is but, the, are the Scalish shows just that hot <laughs> that they're burning up your equipment? It set the monitor on fire, Ken. Do you, do you need do you need heavier gauge <laughs> wire to handle the Scalish programs? Is that... Is that I don't know, man. Much, I called I called Frank up at seven o'clock last night, which is eight o'clock his time. I'm like, look, dude, I don't I don't want to like interrupt your TV watching or dinner or whatever you got going on. But I just want to let you know, I just now wrapped up getting the replay out there. So while all this is going on, Ken. I'm getting text and messages and emails saying, Hey, how come only two minutes 
of yesterday's show is out there. Why is there only two minutes? I'm like, what the heck? So I run over and I go over to the production computer where we do all the editing at, and I pull up YouTube, and the whole show's there. So I don't know what. Yesterday was crazy. I thought Matt was playing tricks on me. I really did. Well, you're, you're one of the most tech-savvy guys I know. I know. And, and if you have a day like that, that gives the rest of us very little hope. <laughs> oh, believe I me, I got, I got creative on this one, Ken. Very, very creative. And even the guy that built the tower for me, he goes, man, I never would have thought of that. Because I called him back up and I go, hey, man, I got everything up and running again. Two new monitors. And I could go into... Uh, the technology that I had to use to be able to get everything back to where it's running again, but that would bore everybody kind of like this story, but you know, yeah, you're right. Frank, Frank set the monitor on fire. That's what happened. America can't handle (laughs) Frank Scalish on 10. You need to ratchet Frank down to about five or six. Uh, And then the equipment can handle it. Cause you're the MacGyver uh, of the the bass fishing tech world. Unbelievable, man. But hey, we are 100%. We are rocking. Like I said, two brand new monitors, uh, a couple of adjustments on the hardware standpoint, and we are good to go. So don't set the man up, the monitor on fire today, Ken. I'm, I'm mellow. I'm I'm yeah. easy going. I'm I'm here at about four or five today, which is you know. <laughs> uh, but but. I am prepared to ramp it up if I need to. Oh, very nice. You need to save that for the marathon show when we do that. I'm 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 so excited about that. You have no yeah. idea. Yeah. If you'll, if you'll have me on in those wee hours oh, of the morning, done. I'm your guy. Done. I'm done. Your guy. That's we'll done. So so stupid and esoteric. No one will be able to stand it. <laughs> All right. So anyway, there was a bunch of people that I was supposed to reach out to via phone yesterday, and obviously with the disaster that took place in the studio, I was unable to do that. I'm going to try and reach out to those people today if everything goes as planned. And hopefully I will find, finally make contact with a bunch of people that I need to reach out to. So that's kind of the scoop on what happened yesterday. Uh, if anybody had an issue with the two-minute show, uh, I, I don't know why that happened. But I think the full show's out there now because I haven't received any other complaints. So let me know. I appreciate the fans Let me know what's going on because sometimes I don't know. And yesterday was just a disaster. Anyway, I'm back to uh, 100% capacity. Things are good to go, and I'm glad to have you on the show, Ken. I'm excited to be here, man. And for those watching or listening who have not had the privilege of a Mark Jeffries telephone call, it goes about like this. Hey, Kenny, how's it going, man? Just wanted to touch base with you and tell you that blah, 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 blah. Does that sound good to you? <laughs> All right, man. Talk to you soon. It's a lot like an Al Lindner call, actually. Uh, yeah. But it's it's, a lot, there's a lot more tech stuff. A lot more it's, scheduling. It's, yeah, I'm very organized. And yesterday yeah. threw me in a loop, man, because I had my day planned out. I had, I had the whole freaking week planned out. And yesterday really, really threw me in a loop. And then, you know, it's 530 and the wife walks in the studio and she's looking at me and my hair is all messed up. I'm sweating. I'm an absolute mess. She goes, uh, did you have a good day? Bad question to ask at that moment. Really bad. Timing was not good. Anyway, so uh, we're going to have a great show today, folks. We're going to talk a lot of stuff. We got a lot going on. Uh, classic, Bassmaster Classic coming up here in, a, in what, a week and a half, something like that? Two weeks, yeah. week and a half. And uh, the MPL, week. I know, one the week one week away. You're right. I leave uh, next week, one week. Yeah. Uh, the MPFL is going on down at the Harris Chain, right in your backyard. Can uh, Bradley Hallman, the guy that is on BTL every now and then, is going to be doing the play-by-play color commentary with Luke Duncan. And I actually talked to Bradley last night, and he is very excited to be able to do he'll, this. He'll and be I just, great at it, you know, he's, dude, he's very just, knowledgeable, articulate. He'll be great at that sort of, that sort of I, thing. I'm just going to refer back to the story that has been told many times on this show. It was about two and a half, three years ago. I asked Bradley, "Hey, man." You ever thought about doing videos and getting involved with the show and and doing a little media? Nope, nope, nope. I want nothing to do with that. All I want to do is fish. That's all I want to do. Now he's got a great YouTube series. He's been uh, on BTL a zillion times. Now he's going to co-host and be the color commentary 
uh, or do the color commentary for the MPFL this weekend and this week at the Harris Chain. So, Bradley, great dude, and just uh, a super, super friend to everybody in the bass fishing world, man. He is. He's he's a very talented guy, and and uh, he's always very interesting, and that's one of the things I love about him. Uh, I actually had a call from NPFL and had an opportunity uh, to get out there and, and do some things, but I haven't been able to take advantage of that. Yeah. Uh, today being my wife's birthday, they were wanting me to be part of a roundtable discussion this evening, but I couldn't make that. And then um, uh, they, were, uh, they asked if I could get out and help with some of the commentary maybe on Friday, but uh, I've got a got an ugly schedule between now and when I leave for the Bassmaster Classic. So I'm not sure I'm going to be able to make it out there like I'd like to, but I am going to try. Then we have uh, the BPT taking place at the Chick, and it's a different type of Chick for uh, the venue this week. And it's going to be really interesting to see if the usual suspects dominate that body of water in this format. And uh, obviously... Jacob Wheeler's got to be way, 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 way up at the uh, the the pundits' picks of who's going to win on the chick. Yeah, you got to look at Wheeler. You got to look at Ot Defoe. Um, those guys are are, are going to be very dangerous. But yeah, a lot of stuff going on, man. A lot of stuff going on. So today we're going to talk a little bit about that. We're going to get into my Elite Series Tournament of Champions list that Ken and, and and had worked very hard to put this concept together, and we're going to show the names on that list and talk a little bit about what, Ken? Don't, don't blame me for this Tournament of Champions <laughs> thing. <laughs> no, it's my idea. I'm not blaming anybody, man. Uh, I'm just kidding. It's, yeah. it's an interesting thought, and I, I do look forward to that, that part of the discussion. And, and let's, let's, let's just sort of tease the 89th anniversary of George Perry's world record largemouth bass because – I know sometime uh, after after the classic, after ICAST, we've talked about doing a show on the world record largemouth and maybe another show on the world record smallmouth. And, and yeah. I think those will be a lot of fun. Uh, but I, I, I want to be wildly prepared for those. And, um, and I, I want to do BTL right. All right. So I'm and that came – that came as a request from several fans that requested you do a show on the world record largemouth, smallmouth, and spotted bass. So we can do that, but but during the course of the spotted bass show, if it lasts an hour and a half or two hours, the record is likely to be broken a few times because <laughs> that thing falls like this, you know? Yeah, rapid, rapid yeah. change on the board. All the right, uh, smallmouth, those are awfully stable. Yes, yes, they are. Uh, let's see here. I What do you want to start off with first? You know, I, I, I really want to get into this, and I kind of teased it on the show yesterday, Ken, about this wonderful stat that was put together, about 43%. That number, 43% of the blue trophies that have been awarded or earned, is what I like to say, earned on the Bassmaster Elite Series, has been earned by 13 different anglers that's crazy <laughs> yeah that, that's true and that was one that I, I put together for you there and it's the guys you'd expect i mean it's it's uh, van dam who has 10 yeah of, of the 140s then you got uh edwin evers todd faircloth aaron martins brandon palinick and skeet reese they have five each uh tommy biffle jason christie greg hackney mike mcclelland those guys all have four and then Steve Kennedy, Ish Monroe, and Chris Lane have three. Um, so as you said, 13 guys have almost half of the wins. And if not for the big MLF defection three years ago, those 13 guys would, would very likely have 50% of the wins by now or, or awfully close to it. That's just an unreal stat. When you sent that to me, Ken, I, I, I literally was in shock. I did not think that that number was going to be that high. That number absolutely blows me away, which I know it's two different numbers, but does 43% translate into the 10% that I always talk about as to 10% of the total professional anglers really are the ones that make that six-figure income? Is that a good statement? 
I think that's a great statement. I think it's absolutely a great statement. And I think um, I think it's 10% earning over 100 uh, if you count, you know, the, the tournament winners, you know, the, the guys who win. If you're talking about the guys who are doing it through endorsements, it's it's a much smaller percentage than that, I think. Yeah. But, yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah, these are the guys who uh, who are making good money. Uh, they're earning a better living for themselves and their families typically than they would be able to earn perhaps in another line of work. And, uh, and they made nice career choices. So because, because of their skills and because of their ability to market themselves. So yeah, I think, I think that's pretty well dead on a good rule of thumb there. All right. I kind of want to take a right turn, but it's somewhat related to what we're talking about right now. On previous shows, and I can't remember if it was Matt or if it was Frank, or it might even been you, where we got into the discussion about endorsements and royalties. Why is this such a secret and really, really hush-hush and always has been in the fishing industry, but when you look at other indus- industries when it comes to endorsements, it's not like that. Why so many secrets in this industry, Ken? I think it's because there are so many big disparities between what these guys are getting. Uh, there's not a real standard out there. Uh, and, and people don't want to share sometimes because they think they've got, got it really good. And yeah. sometimes they don't want to share because they, they feel like they might be being taken advantage of. Um, they don't know how good their deal is or how bad their deal is. Um, you know, it's always been my understanding that, uh, that there were relatively few royalty type deals in our in, in pro fishing until maybe the last 10 or 12 years. Okay. And I think guys like Skeet Reese uh, in particular maybe changed a lot of that. You know, Skeet had his his rods with Wright and McGill that were enormous sellers. Enormous sellers. Mm-hmm. They were quality rods at a great price point. And I think, you know, guys, Skeet Reese made a lot of money on those is my understanding. And, and good for him. Good for him. He, he deserved it. Yeah. Uh, he's not just a super talented angler. He's extremely bright. He's a good businessman. And, uh, and he made a nice, a nice amount of money on those rods, which sold wildly well. They were at a great price point. Um, and, and I think he opened a lot of people's eyes to that commission thing now or, or royalty thing. The other thing about the royalty thing that's always blown me away is you hear guys talk about it a lot and they have, they seem to have a little idea as to what that royalty should be. You know, well, should it be 1% or 15%, you know, <laughs> of the, the MSRP and, and, and who knows, you know, who knows, but, but the royalties that, that I have, personal knowledge of are are pretty modest when you're talking about percentages they're in that that five percent and less range um so you got to sell a lot of stuff a lot of little stuff to make real money at it Mm -hmm. and and it's tough it's tough the other thing i would say about it is Guys have been reluctant in some cases to go. I don't know why more why more sponsors and, and, and manufacturers don't go with a royalty deal, because to me, that gives them uh, a lot more opportunity to get the pro really behind it and pushing it. Um, but I think a lot of pros maybe don't trust a lot of the manufacturers to give them accurate numbers. A lot of pros seem to believe that these manufacturers are raking in the cash when quite often they are not. Um, so it's a, it's an interesting, and, and, you know, most anglers are out there representing themselves on their own. They don't yeah. have agents and attorneys doing the work for them. So it's a, it's a really tough environment and, uh, it's not, you know, you, you look at what happens in the NFL or major league baseball or the NBA and, uh, take a couple of zeros off that. And then you're looking at the world. <laughs> So, like, let's say a lure sells, and we'll just do simple math here, sells for 10 bucks. What do you think the average royalty that somebody is getting off that? 50 cents? A dollar? For a $10 product, I yeah. think it's uh, probably less than 50 cents. Wow. Got to sell a lot of crankbaits, man. 
<laughs> yeah, you got to sell a lot of crankbaits. You really do. And, and, yeah. and, and if you really want to make any money on it, you almost need a royalty deal with a big company that's really turning out a lot of those products because the big company turning out a lot of the products can better afford the royalty because their cost in production is much lower than yeah. a small company making many fewer baits. Their distribution is better um, the, uh, in a big company and their marketing efforts are better and stronger. If I were a manufacturer, I would be happy to give a guy a, a royalty or a commission on sales because I think I could probably save myself a lot of money that way. Mm -hmm. Also, I think that I would have that, that pro staff angler working harder for me that way, but I would not put the angler's name on the product. I mean, not, not directly. I wouldn't name it after him. I wouldn't probably put his name on the product because then you're kind of stuck. <laughs> what if the guy, guy jumped ship on you and now you've got a hundred thousand packages with, with Mark Jeffrey's name on it Yeah, and you got to repackage them or you've got to have them destroyed or you've got to repaint them or whatever you got to do. It's uh, it's tough. There are not many guys who are really worth uh, a deal like that, a signature series type deal like that. It's a, it's a handful. Let me ask you this in the modern era. And when I say the modern era, let's just say the last 30 years, who would be the first professional to have his name on either a bait or a rod or a reel or something like that? Do you know that? Well, uh, I, I don't know offhand, but I'm, I'm guessing it's probably Bill Dance, but that would have been way more than 30 years ago. Yeah. I mean, you get into 30 years ago, you're really talking about the beginning of Kevin Van Dam's full-time career as a bass pro because he really got cranking about 91. Yeah. Um, but Bill Dance had his name on stuff well before that. Roland Martin, Jimmy Houston. Of course, Tom Mann owned his own companies that were producing uh, baits and electronics. So his name was on, on everything. Um, but it, the names on the products have been around a, a long, long time. Um, 60 years. I mean, not, maybe not 60 years, but 50 years anyway. And, wow. uh, and I think that when you go back only 30 years, it was fairly, fairly common. And Daiwa was putting uh, guys' names on products. I mean, the Hibbins' names were on products. Nixon, Brower, uh, even 35 years ago, those guys had, had signature series products out there. Here's an interesting question from our good friend JD. Ken, if you were an angler, would you rather have a percentage or a dollar amount for a royalty deal, or would you rather have a contract arrangement? All right, Jay Diz, here's my answer to you. Uh, if I'm dealing with a small company that is uh, that is not producing millions of baits, then I would probably just like to have a flat fee. Here's what you're going to pay me every month. That's what I get. Let's go year to year. Uh, if I was working with a giant company, uh, a pure fishing, a Pradco, uh, a, a Strike King lose that is making millions of baits, that has great distribution, that's everywhere in every shop you go into. Then I might look pretty hard at the um, at the royalty deal because mm -hmm. I know they're going to produce enough stuff that if if we can sell it, I'm going to I'm going to have a ought to have a pretty healthy income. But I'd also want that contract to be very explicit and specific about what sort of marketing efforts are going to be made, what the marketing budget is going to be, how some of that marketing money is going to be spent. Is it going to be spent on television? How much is going to go to the internet? Uh, how much is going to go to, to Mark Jeffries and BTL? I want to know these things so I can figure out uh, if they're going to get behind it and push it properly. Okay. Now in this entire conversation, this point has not been brought up, but I am a big believer that every single contract, no matter who you sign up with, be it big or small, that contract needs to be incentive-based. And when by, what I mean by that is the more exposure that you get on live, mainly live, all right, and television, 
then there are incentive bonuses built into that contract because, let's face it, Ken, agree or disagree, that's where the most exposure takes place, be it on the live segments and on television. Is that right or wrong? I think you're absolutely right about that. And I think that I think that all these contracts should be incentive-based. And I think that these pro staff managers should have every reason to incentivize incentivize these guys. Like yeah. you make a master classic, that's worth this much. You win a tournament, that's worth this much. You make this many TV appearances, that's worth X amount. You're on the cover of Bassmaster magazine or, or Bass Fishing magazine, that's worth this. Um, and I, I think that that's the way you have to uh, you have to incentivize folks because otherwise I, I, I just think things don't get done. All right, Ken, this is a question that you could take 20, 30 minutes, probably even longer to answer. Maybe I should save this one for the uh, marathon show, but I'm going to go ahead and ask it. Why is it that so many guys and girls out there want to chase to be one of those 10% guys or girls? Why is that? Uh, I think it's a couple of things. I think one is they have only a vague idea of how difficult it is and how long the odds are to get there. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, When, when, when you're dealing with the the young people you work with at the high school level who are playing basketball, Mm -hmm. uh, they don't imagine that they're going to be Jeff Petrie, who you probably don't remember from old ABA days. (laughs) They think they're going to be LeBron James or Michael Jordan. And they, they don't see the highway littered with the guys who didn't make it and who didn't have a plan B. They see, they see the top of the mountain and they don't see the, uh, the dead bodies on the way to the top of Everest. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I think that's part of it. And, and the other thing about it is, um, this is, I, I think this is true for, for so many of us who, who embark upon some sort of career in whatever industry. You know, I went to law school. I practiced law for a while. I didn't know anybody who was a lawyer. And I wish I had because it might have it might have changed things for me. Mm-hmm. I wonder how many of these young people who want to become the next Kevin Van Dam or Edwin Evers or Jacob Wheeler, I wonder how many of them actually know a, a touring bass pro and have spent significant time with that person to see what that lifestyle and what that life is really like. And then take a look at their tax return. <laughs> because now you're getting a glimpse of reality. Oh, geez. All right. Well, I mean, seriously. If, I, if you, I, I, if you I'm with you, that, man. If you yeah. don't do that, your eyes are not wide open, no matter what you may think. Yeah. All right. Here's here's another really good question which angler past or present does ken think has had the most influence on sales with slapping their name on the product hands down there's just one name it's bill dance bill dance is more impactful on sales than any other angler in history um bill dance and, and you know most of your audience doesn't remember when bill was a competitor and Bill was an amazing competitor. Bill Dance won seven of the first 20 BASS tournaments. Won then. I'm sorry, eight of the first 20 BASS tournaments. One of them was a team tournament. Won them. That's insane. Nobody's ever done anything like that before, and nobody's ever going to do it again. Um, Bill Dance has this amazing personality. He's got a magnetic charm about him. He's funny. He's He's entertaining. Uh, Zebco Quantum did a thing a few years ago at the Classic Mark. I think I might have mentioned it even on BTL. They they pulled the people coming into the Classic Expo. I think this was the one in uh, Chattanooga. And they, they pulled the people coming in, asking them, if, do they recognize this name as being an angler? 80% of the people walking into the Classic Expo recognize Bill Dance as an angler. The next guys down were Hank Parker, Jimmy Houston, Roland Martin. 
Then when you got down around 25%, you got to Kevin Van Dam, the greatest tournament angler of all time. <laughs> this is at the Bassmaster Classic Expo, and in case you're wondering, Van Dam's won four of them. Yeah. When you got down to Jordan Lee, who at that point was coming off back-to-back classic wins, 2%. These are people walking into the classic expo. Two <laughs> percent knew who Jordan Lee was. Wow! Now, now that, that that's one of the myths I think about the expo is a lot of guys go and they think, "Wow, this is this is where everybody who's everybody in the world of fishing is," and these are fishing's biggest fans. Yeah. Not really. These are a bunch of people who know there's a free event. It's about fishing. They can go check it out. Maybe somebody will give them a rod and reel. Who knows? Um, so it's not exactly the uh, the bass fishing intelligentsia there, but, <laughs> but Bill Dance is significantly bigger name than anyone else in the sport, and uh, Bill moves more product than anybody, probably to this day. Kevin Van Dam moves a tremendous amount of product. Yeah, um, you know, absolutely. Skeet Reese moves a tremendous amount of product. Gerald Swindle moves a tremendous amount of product. Edwin Evers moves a tremendous amount of product. But compare him to Bill Dance, especially historically, and Bill's way up there. All right, here's an interesting question from Jim. Bill Dance and the guys from back in the day, back then, didn't have the competition that's out there these days. Does Ken think they would be relevant today from a competition standpoint? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because what, what Jim needs to factor in here is that well, here's what I would say about the level of competition in, in the early 70s versus the level of competition today. The level of competition today is a lot flatter, okay? It's a lot flatter. The difference between the best guys and the middle guys is not as steep as it used to be. And in an MLF tournament where 80 guys are, are competing – there are probably 50 of them who have a chance to win going in 50 out of 80. That's really good. Back in the, um, back in the early seventies when Bill dance, Roland Martin, those guys were making a name for themselves. Uh, the fields were, were over 200 typically. And, and there might've only been 40 guys in that whole field who really had any sort of chance at winning, but, but Bill dance and Roland Martin, they still had to beat those guys. And um, if Bill Dance and Roland Martin were 30 years old today instead of 80 and 81, which is what they are, then uh, then those guys would be absolutely as competitive as anyone you see out there because they'd be learning the new electronics. They'd be figuring out uh, how to deal with, with all the issues that today's younger anglers were doing. And, and Bill Dance and Roland Martin, I don't think they would dominate the way they did then but I think they'd be absolutely as good as anybody. Hey, and Roland no, was, yeah, Roland in, in his day, in his prime, probably one of the most innovative anglers out there on tour. And easily the most dominant angler in professional bass fishing history, Roland yeah. Martin. There was yeah. a three-year stretch between in 71, 72, 73, when he won Angler of the Year awards, where his average, and, and these were fields that were sometimes close to 300 anglers, his average finish was in the top 3%. His average. That's crazy. He, he rarely finished out of the top, out of the top seven or eight. Rarely. It was crazy. It, when, when I love it when people say, oh, Kevin Van Dam is the most dominant angler in professional history. Not even close. Yeah. Van Dam is the best of all time. I believe that 100%. He is not even close to being the most dominant. That would be Roland Martin. Yeah. Good stuff there, Ken. All right, we're going to take our first break. Come back, talk a little Tournament of Champions with Ken Duke, the man. Everybody stay tuned here on a Wednesday. We'll be right back. fishing system starts with Lorenz HDS Live. The best fish finding tools from Chirp Sonar and Fish Reveal to active imaging and new active target live sonar and complete touchscreen control from your trolling motor to your big motor. For a limited time, building the ultimate fishing system will be easier on your wallet. 
Upgrade to HDS Live with a ghost trolling motor, active target sonar, or live sight sonar, and save up to $800. FastCat's legendary 20-foot platform has been paired with Angler-approved accessories for 2021. Puma FTD features the proven hull used by many of the top names in bass fishing today, backed by a transferable lifetime warranty. The Puma FTD boasts a full team deck concept which enhances efficiency for you and your tournament partners. Turnkey tournament winning performance. The Puma FTD SP from BassCat. Let's face it, fishing electronics are no longer an afterthought. They've become a necessity. And at the Bass Tank, our experts match you with the right electronics, provide professional installation, and educate you to help maximize your catching results while providing support along the way. <laughs> because let's be honest, it's about catching, not just fishing. And when you're ready for better results, join the Bass Tank team. Visit us today on Facebook or go to thebasstank.com. You've been waiting all week for this. And Sunline wants to make sure you're ready for it with bulk spools of all your favorite fishing lines. Oh, so fun. Bulk up with Sunline. Utilizing my experience, utilizing my time on the water, evolving as an angler, and that evolution should never stop. You have to do it every day. From when you wake up in the morning, you gotta be thinking about changing, continually changing every minute, every cast. That's really the premise of fishing the moment. Everyone, Brandon Polnick here. People always be asking me what I got tied on. I'm like, Exxon Lures. And they're like, Brandon, why you got Exxon Lures tied on? And I'm like, let me show you why. The bite. Hey. Get out of there. Get out of there. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's freaking thinking. Get in here. Oh, God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. I think you get the point. All right, we are back on a Wednesday hump day. It's finally stopped raining here in Oklahoma, dude. The lakes can over in eastern Oklahoma absolutely blown out with water. I mean, they're they're blown out. There's no other way of putting it. Lots of rain here in Oklahoma, so finally got a day today where it is not supposed to rain. I think there's only a 30% chance of rain. Uh, I do want to mention this real quick, Ken. On Monday, June 7th, uh, I've seen a lot of questions about the Bassmaster Classic on the Instant Feedback and on the YouTube comments. We're going to have Bruce Aiken on the show June 7th. That's Monday. And we're going to dive into how challenging 2020 was, uh, what his thoughts are on 2021 so far, a summertime classic, some of the logistics that uh, have been challenging to overcome moving everything around and just kind of get his take on the status of of everything elite series and bass so mark that one down monday bruce aiken live here on btl and we will dive into classic week with the man i think it's gonna be a big classic mark i think it's yeah. gonna be a, a lot of if they don't do at least say one hundred twenty-five thousand people through the expo i'll be surprised i think it's gonna be big yeah, me too. Uh, I think the crowd is definitely going to show up. I think the crowds at the show will be wall to wall once again, uh, like they are always. And it'll be interesting to see what the boat traffic's like. You know, with it being summertime, Ray Roberts, uh, not too far from a very, very large metropolitan area. I know that lake gets a lot of pressure. And it'll be interesting to see. It's not that big, Ken. It really isn't. It'll be interesting to see what effect that the uh, observing boats and boat traffic has on the guys during the three days 
Yeah, it's less than 30,000 acres out there, so it is, it's likely to be tight. I mean, it's Dallas, Fort Worth. My gosh, there's got to be uh, more bass boats around there than just about anywhere you can imagine. <laughs> um, and that's always interesting to me. You know, it, it for a long time now, guys have had to factor in boat traffic in, in an event like the Bassmaster Classic. And, of course, the guy who is a magician at dealing with it is Kevin Van Dam, and he's not – not in the classic, but yeah. it's interesting to see who pulls the most boats out there. Um, it, it'd probably be somebody like like Palnick. Yeah, yeah. It's going to be a, a different classic. And are you in favor of moving it around? I don't think I've ever asked you that. You know, spring classic, summer classic, fall classic. Should it be moved around, Ken? Wow. Uh, no, I, I, I'm I'm a believer that it should be kind of a fixed time in the year. Okay. Um, but I'm not, I'm not sure I know what the best time of year would be for it. I think the best time of year for it would either be that late winter, early spring or summer, but I'm not sure which is best. I, yeah. I was at bat when I, when I got to bass, it was a, a, a summer thing. And, and then soon after it became a, a late winter, early spring thing. And, um, and there are benefits to both. I don't like a fall classic. Weights are down, people, attendance is typically down, but I, I see the advantages of summertime when kids are out of school, people are taking vacations. I see the advantage certainly of the late winter, early spring classics because weights are up. It's more exciting for the people up north who have cabin fever. Yeah. Uh, is a nice escape, whether you go down and check it out in person or whether you just watch it on TV or on the internet. Um, I'm not sure. I'd like to. I'd have to look at it. And you also got to consider what are what are Bass's goals with the classic. You know, is it uh, where where do they most monetize it? Um, certainly, they monetize by having a successful expo. So you got to figure out where do you have your best attendance mm -hmm. in terms of timing and also location. Because you and I have talked about this before, but when you have a, a classic in in February or March. You, you eliminate more than half the country north to south as to where you can do it. Yeah. Uh, some of the coolest classics have been kind of up north. The Pittsburgh Classic in 2005 was horrendous fishing, but is extremely well attended. And, oh, it was uh, insane. <laughs> yeah. Wildly enthusiastic audiences. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's a tough question, but I, I'd like to see it, you know, plug it in somewhere, keep it there so people can kind of, plan around it better well forget about the classic right now because there's one event that they can move around and have any time that they want and i'm talking about the mystical mythical tournament of champions and we're 15 years into it almost 15 years uh we are 15 years because it started in 2006 ish monroe was the very first bassmaster elite series champion uh we're 15 years into it and i truly truly feel that in the best interest of the anglers the organization and the sponsors and really most importantly the fans that the time has come to have an elite series tournament of champions what are your thoughts ken i would love to see a tournament of champions i would love to see uh something like that where you had clearly defined qualifications and 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 you could anticipate who's going to get in and maybe even a fan element where fans get to vote in uh, some other people. But I don't think it's going to happen for a variety of reasons. And I think the biggest reason is that the leagues, you know, the leagues are too disparate. The leagues have conflicting goals and aspirations. And so I don't see a, a true tournament of champions coming about anytime soon. Yeah, probably not, but it, it, it would be something really, really great to think about. Uh, I'm going to throw up this graphic, and what this graphic is, is this is the, the current list based upon how I believe that the field for the Tournament of Champions should be set. And I kind of explained this before, but now you're going to get a really good idea. The field, let me get over here, is going to be set to the current, most current, 44 champions 
And obviously, you're going to have some doubles in there. Actually, 45. I'm sorry. And yeah. then you're going to have the classic champs from the year 2000, uh, 2007, which is actually based upon what happened in 2006, the way that things go. So when you look at the field, it goes basically by the latest winner, and then you have the oldest blue trophy champion which would be 45th place which would be mike mcclellan and when you look at this field let's just kind of go through it uh from the bottom up Poroznik, iconelli chris lane skeet reese edwin evers faircloth Britt myers uh randall tharp lucas defoe wheeler horton murray cannell kennedy aaron martins Hawk, KVD, Strader, Benton, Hackney, Monroe, uh, Daniels, Jr., Bertrand, Clun, Blaylock, Cobb, Hartman, Frazier, Jakobson, uh, Mueller, Buddy Gross, Chris Johnston, Weidler, Tally, Polinick, Walters, New, Gustafson, Bill Lowen, Jason Christie, uh, Livesey, Wes Logan, and the latest winner, Caleb Cuphall. I, dude, that, that field is unbelievable, Ken. It's a very strong field, but anytime you have a, a reduced field like that, Mark, you're probably not actually as – well, it's a very strong field. Uh, it would be a very impressive field. Um. But again, I just uh, I, I don't see what incentive either Bass or MLF has for participating in such a thing. And 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 everything about the field there is is BASS. So how are you going to incentivize other than money? Yeah. How do you incentivize uh, MLF to uh, to not schedule something against it so that their guys don't participate? <laughs> well. Once again, in a perfect situation, uh, kind of the peacemaker between both organizations and the communication between both organizations is to have this event. And it eventually what's going to happen, Ken, eventually is over time, the MLF guys are going to actually be phased out of the field eventually. Yeah. And I don't know how many years that's going to take, but... Well, with, with every tournament, you fa you're basically phasing one out. With every tournament, you're phasing one out. Exactly. The next, yeah, the next guy, if there's a new winner, somebody who's not on that list, then you're going to yeah. phase out Mike McClellan. And, yeah. uh, and after that, you, you phase out Jacob Peroznik. And after that, you phase out Iconelli. So guys are being phased out with every tournament if you have a, a, a new winner. Yeah. Well, like I said – you're exactly right. Over time, those guys are going to be phased out unless they choose to go back to Bass and they end up winning a blue trophy. Then, boom, they go back on the list. Uh, in other sports, and especially individual sports, there is an enormous pride factor in taking place of qualifying for the Tournament of Champions. Uh, I know there's a lot of... of accolades and a lot of achievement by making the Bassmaster Classic, but can you tell me uh, who finished 25th in the 2017 Bassmaster Classic off the top of your head? If you give me 30 seconds, I can. No, 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 no Googling, <laughs> all right? No, but but the point I'm trying to make is, oh, that dude, yeah, he was, he was in the Tournament of Champions. He's got a blue trophy. What could happen between... The organizations, yes, that is a massive, massive mountain to overcome uh, until eventually all the MFL or MLF anglers are uh, taken out of the field due to other guys winning blue trophies. But you know, for, what, Ken? I was just saying, I, I love the tournament of champion idea, tournament of champions idea, and, and there's absolutely no reason that an organization like BASS couldn't do it. And I think that the the parameters is all you'd really need to uh, to concern yourself with there. What I think you could do is you can invite all the winners from the current season, 
which is going to be what nine guys because they'll have nine regular season events, and then you invite maybe the uh, the top five guys in the AOI race, and you have a really small and and no no work your way down the list so that if one of the winners is also top five AOI, you know you move down to the next guy. No, yeah. I, I like the idea of a very small tournament. With all with all due respect, Ken, I am going to graciously disagree with that because there is something about the heart and soul of earning that blue trophy, of which when you earn that blue trophy, you earn a berth into the Tournament of Champions. It doesn't need to be this hybrid thing of, yeah, let's take five guys from over here and add a couple more and let's get this guy over here. Dude, you win that blue trophy, you know what? You're in the TFC. That's okay. it. Okay, I, I get that. Yeah. What I think you – here's the reason why I like getting the AOI in there. The AOI is almost without exception a star. That's a guy who's really – I think we would both agree that's the guy who's got the more prestigious title. Yeah. Um, and, and if you invite the last few of those guys, you really dramatically increase the star power of your field. Whereas if you just go with the uh, – with the blue trophy winners, take a look at the blue trophy winners this year. Okay. There's some, there's some names in that list there that, that maybe people are not going to, not going to spend a lot of time. But you know what, Ken, I, I see for. your point, but, but that is the new generation and what they're trying to support those guys that win. It, it doesn't matter if it's John Smith, the dude well, won a blue trophy. Get him yeah, in the TOC. My focus is always going to be on, on one thing, and I think this is the thing that a lot of organizations have screwed up on. Who comes first? The fan has to come first. The yeah. fan. Nobody else, not Kevin Van Dam, not Clark Wendland, not Brandon Palnick. The fan has to come first. And if the fan doesn't come first – Everything else comes tumbling down, and there and we wind up with nothing. Yeah. So I want to give the best. I want to create the best possible tournament for the fan, and that means making sure you got your big names. <laughs> hey man, that list though, I, I I you can't argue with that list. That that would be a heck of a tournament for the fans and for the sponsors and for the anglers. Make it a no entry fee event. It's not the Bassmaster Classic. Never will be the Bassmaster Classic. But it could be the Tournament of Champions. We'll see if that ever comes to fruition. Anyway, uh, you know, Ken, you've known me for a long time. I'm always thinking, dude. I'm always trying to step out there and create things that are better for this game. And uh, I think we're finally getting to the point now where MLF is kind of going their direction and Bass is kind of going their direction. All right, maybe is it time to extend – uh, an invitation to where we understand that both are going to coexist at least right now, and let's well, do uh, this thing. You you've kind of talked around what I think is the main reason that there will never be a a tournament of champions like you're talking about, and that is that these organizations, one of them, has been very vocal about it. Their goal is to own the sport. Their goal yeah. is to be the last organization standing. And as long as one of them has that avowed goal, they have absolutely no reason. Yeah. And, and it makes no sense for them to try to cooperate with the other guys. I get they it. They should I get not it, man. cooperate with the other guys. I get it. But I think it's important. And, and some fans out there may not agree with what I'm about to say. But I think it's vitally important not to forget the accomplishments, the accomplishments that were made by a number of anglers that are fishing in MLF and what they did during the history of the Elite Series. You can't just erase that and go, oh, well, he's just fishing MLF. No, you can't. No, of course not. And and a lot of the guys who left BASS to, to join MLF, they left their legacy behind, and they will never build another significant legacy through MLF or any other organization because yeah. – either they're perhaps past their prime or the new rules and format and structure don't suit their styles. Um, yeah, there are guys who, who left everything behind to start the new league. 
Yeah. And uh, yeah, I'm not I'm not suggesting that we forget what they accomplished at Bass. I would argue that that BASS is the only organization that has ever created a star. And I, I defy anybody to tell me another organization that's ever created a star. Bass is the only one. Uh, but but when your avowed goal and mission is to put them out of business. <laughs> <laughs> or buy them and yeah. thereby put them out of business, then I don't see I don't see much room for uh cooperation. If that were my goal, I wouldn't cooperate. Wow, I'm I'm reading some of the comments on the instant feedback. Uh some of them are kind of out there, others really good, but it is what it is. It's just a thought and and once again, uh I know in other individual sports they do have a tournament of champions and I think the 15 year mark with the elite series would be a great time to start that obviously I am thoroughly out of my mind to even think that this would be a possibility but I wanted to throw it out there Ken I, I love your idea and that's one of the things I love about Mark Jeffries is Mark Jeffries is always thinking always trying to make things better, always trying to come up with a, a new way to look at something. And that's one of the things I love about Mark Jeffries. He's, mm. he's one of you're, you're, Hey man, you're one of the thought leaders of the sport. And mm. uh, that's, that's a big, big deal. I, I noticed somebody on uh, YouTube posted the thing. What about Scott Martin? FOW yeah. created Scott Martin. Well, no, they didn't. Scott Martin created Scott Martin. <laughs> and, and anybody who believes otherwise wasn't paying attention. Scott Martin uh, had a little help maybe from FLW, but Scott Martin did that himself through television and through YouTube and, yeah. uh, FLW helped this much. And, and Scott, who's one of the hardest working guys in the sport did the rest. Yeah. Pretty amazing. Uh, what, what he's done and the brand that he has continued and established for himself too. All right, man, I want to shift gears. Uh, and then we're going to take our final break. So when we come back, I want to dive into a little bit about iCast. iCast okay. is going down this year in July, correct? Yes, it is. Uh, first in-person iCast in a couple of years. I'm looking forward to it. All right, so we will we will dive into uh, a couple of subjects for iCast this year and then come back and wrap things up here on a Wednesday. So, uh, by the way, man, I really appreciate all the fans and your comments. It keeps the conversation spiced up. And uh, really, really value what people are thinking out there. Because you're right, Ken. The fans make this happen, dude. Absolutely. They, they do. They come first. All right. Everybody stay tuned. We'll be right back on a Wednesday. Pro-inspired. Pro-designed. Tested and proven by legends on the water. Dominating the tournament trail for over 50 years. Everything you need, one legendary brand. Strike King. Hey guys, Major League Fishing Pro, Jacob Wheeler here with my new signature series line of rods with Ducket Fishing. We have my 7.2 crank and rod right here. Crankbaits can be very fickle and having the right, you know, having a lot of tip can be too much and having not enough tip can, you know, lose a lot of fish. So you really got to be careful. If there's one or two techniques that I'm really, really adamant about having the perfect action is a crankbait, especially like a square bill, a DT6. Um, you know, those medium running crankbaits in the springtime, when those fish's mouth are pretty tough, that's when I'm really, really, really on top of having my actions just perfect. Big companies get bigger and bigger and talk about their fancy labs where they study fish behavior, but then they all go golfing on the weekend. We don't have a large laboratory to test baits. Why, you ask? We don't need a big laboratory because our pros fish, our employees fish, our salespeople fish, our suppliers fish, our mold builders fish, our owners fish, and our kids fish. This is our laboratory. Our R&D comes from time on the water, learning how to make fish bite. 
All that time on the water brings us thousands of hours of testing new products and improving current ones for all species. Guys, what makes our Spro lures beat the competition? I mean, you have to admit, we nailed it with my McSticks and rock crawlers. Man, we've all won money on my plugs. My Wamex shot put fish in my boat. One thing's for sure, we all count on our Spro lures to beat the competition. Designing cutting edge baits with some of America's top anglers, Spro lures beat the competition. To see the entire lineup, visit a retailer near you or Spro.com. The Ned Rig. What rod should I be using with the Ned Rig? My favorite is the Denali Lithium Multi Spin Rod. It's our seven foot four length, great Ned Rig rod. It's got a great sensitive tip on it. It's long enough where I can make long casts, which you're usually fishing clear water with a Ned Rig, and it's got enough backbone to get those fish in. So check it out Denali Lithium Series, seven foot four Multi Spin. All right, we are back, wrapping up Wednesday with our good friend Ken Duke. And we're going to talk a little iCast now. And what are your thoughts, man, going into it, Ken? I'm really looking forward to iCast. I mean, not only do I think it's going to be an interesting show because uh, I think there's going to be a lot of innovation on display this year. You know, last year uh, we did not have an in-person iCast. Uh, people were having a hard time getting their prototypes done. So I think uh, it's not that the, the industry took a year off because it didn't. The industry worked hard last year to, to, to try to keep up with demand and so forth. But this year I'm expecting big things on uh, innovation. And I'm also looking forward to the aspect of iCast that I love so much, which is iCast as kind of a, a, a reunion. It's the time I get to see people I, I, I don't get to see, except maybe – at ICAST or the Bassmaster Classic. So that's always a good time for me. Yeah. Uh, what are your thoughts as far as the participation and the uh, activeness of companies attending ICAST this year? Yeah, that, that's a tough question, Mark. You know, um, for me, the ICAST trip is 25 minutes down I-4. And uh, uh, that's, that's lucky. For, for guys who are coming from Canada or Japan or Europe, uh, it could be a real problem because they may have to quarantine to go back home mm -hmm. or, or have problems like that. There may be travel restrictions that are going to prevent them from being there. So I am, I'm definitely expecting there will be some conspicuous absences at ICAST, maybe not in terms of the companies being conspicuously absent, but a lot of the personalities may be. Some of the companies won't be there in the same force that they usually are. They'll have a smaller footprint. They'll have smaller staffs. But there will be somewhere between probably around 600, 650 different uh, exhibitors at the show. And I think most of the people that you and I are used to seeing there will be there. I think attendance will be down a little bit. Uh, in, in recent years, attendance has been around 15,000. If you told me there will be 10 or 11,000 there this year, I'd, I'd say, yeah, it sounds about right. And it sounds pretty good. All right. Uh, how many times in the numerous years that you have attended ICAST that when you're walking down the aisle and you see something and you go, huh, that looks like just like an X, you know, <laughs> just like bait X. What's going on here? That looks just oh. like bait Y. I can't count that high, Mark. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's you're, you're absolutely right, and that's one of the yeah. that's one of the um, the ugly truths about business generally, but also certainly true in the fishing industry. Uh, what we see a lot is uh, a lot of the great innovation comes from the smaller companies, and the smaller companies may not have the bankroll to protect a lot of their efforts with patents and and uh, other things like that or yeah. they can't get to the market very quickly, or they don't have the big enough production to keep up with early demand. And so some of the bigger guys step in and uh, have faster production, better distribution, fewer barriers to entry, and they, they take over. Um, and that's unfortunate, but it, it's, uh, you gotta put on your big boy pants. You gotta, 
you got to do things to the best of your ability and you got to do the smart things. I've seen so many companies come out with something really cool and different and, uh, and then think that they're going to be able to scale and get that product out in the marketplace uh, without doing all the, the due diligence they need to do about things like patents and so forth and trademarks or whatever it might be. And then they bemoan the fact that a year later, uh, some big company totally owns that, that market, totally owns it, just completely kicked their butt, ate their lunch, and, and, is now, <laughs> and is now seen as the leader in that category. Well, you know, nobody said that the rest of the world was going to sit still after you introduce something really cool. Yeah. Uh, you got to find a way to compete or, and, and I've advised many companies to do this in the past, sell. If you're not prepared to step up and capitalize upon your fancy new creation, you ought to consider selling it to somebody who can and make your money that way. It's it's an ugly truth, but it is the truth. Yeah, interesting. Um, this season on both of the major professional trails, it seems like there's been a pretty substantial topwater vibe. Uh, it seems like ICAST, we go through trends based upon what seems to be hot in the industry. Can you see any trend from a lure standpoint that the fans should be kind of eyeing coming in this ICAST? You know, I think we've seen a topwater thing because the weather has been a little different. We had a longer spring yeah. Even here in Florida. You know, we're, we've had some days in the, in the 90s, but not a lot of them considering it's, uh, it's already June. Um, and I think that that is an impact on it, but I am seeing some, some cool trends, saw some cool stuff when I went to Spirit Lake, Iowa, uh, on a Berkeley trip a couple of weeks ago, saw some amazing technology. They're really putting their science into their baits, uh, I think to a, to a greater and stronger and, and better degree than ever before. Um, but that's one company and it's hard to say that that that's a trend, um, it sounds like I'm trying to avoid your question, Mark. I'm not. <laughs> Sometimes the only way I can see what the trend is is go to ICAST and see yeah. see the coincidences that, that two companies have come out with a very similar bait. Yeah. Um, with so many different players in the bass industry, I think sometimes we make a mistake when we say, oh, there's a trend toward this and soft plastics. No, I think there's always – a bunch of soft plastic companies doing a variety of different things where the trend happens is what catches on in the marketplace. Um, what's selling, you know, because quite often companies make baits that are, that just don't get the right push because they, they didn't have a tournament wind behind them. Uh, Zoom came out with the brush hog long before creature baits became popular. Creature baits became popular after Davy Height won a classic in New Orleans in '99 uh, with a gambler uh, bacon rind. Yeah, but that boosted a bait that Zoom had made years before called the Brush Hog. Um, the Senko came out in the mid '90s, like '95 or '96, but it took four or five years before that thing really, really caught on. So sometimes the baits come out. And, and it takes the angling community a while to catch up with them and really create the big market push. Hey, do you remember when Daryl Robertson won the FLW championship at Fort Gibson and he was using a bait that wasn't in production yet, but they were actually manufacturing it. And at the press conference or whatever you want to call it, he said, well, I'm using this thing. It kind of looks like a brush hog. And it was a who daddy. And, and that's where the who daddy got started. So, uh, it's kind of funny that the reference back to the brush hog because that really was kind of the first creature bait that everybody just kind of latched onto. Yeah, it's uh, Ed Chambers, the late, great Ed Chambers, I think the greatest soft plastics innovator of all time. Yeah. Um, the fluke, the trick worm, the brush hog, the horny toad, uh, green pumpkin. These are just some of the yeah. things that, that – Ed Chambers and Zoom Bait Company created. Um, but, you know, you mentioned an interesting thing, Robertson and the prototype. How many times have we gone to a classic press conference and had a guy tell us it was a prototype? 
you know, when in fact yeah. it was a competitor's bait. Um, <laughs> I think, or they don't, they don't make it anymore. That's another line you hear a lot. Well, I was using this crankbait, you know, and they don't make it anymore. So, <laughs> well, you got guys, well, you got guys uh, out there. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to single anybody out. But a lot of fans know who they are, who basically don't use any lures that are made now. Uh, they've, got, <laughs> they've got favorites that are out of production, and, and that's what they throw, and they know what those yeah. are to do, and they don't mess with the new stuff that much. But, uh, but, but I think the days of of lying about baits, misleading about baits, nah. are largely over. Yeah. Because cameras are so ubiquitous. Yeah, yeah. Here's an interesting question. Uh, last year's iCast was virtual. Does Ken think that there was any takeaways or anything learned from that, and will it change on how iCast is done going forward? Yeah, I think absolutely. Uh, my takeaway from it was um, that a virtual iCast allows many, many, many more people to attend attend mm -hmm. uh, and see the products. So I think a virtual iCast moving forward is going to have to be a part of every iCast. Maybe not this year, maybe not next year, but eventually and soon. iCast will have to be virtual. And one day it will likely take the place of the in-person iCast. But for now, in-person iCast is where it's at because the industry is not ready for a totally virtual iCast. Uh, technology is not ready for a totally virtual iCast, and um, and and I, I'm glad for that. I'm yeah. glad because I don't I don't want that yet. So my big takeaway was virtual is is part of the future, and virtual may be the exclusive aspect of future iCast, but that's years away. Yeah, here's a great question. Uh, somebody wanted to know. Let's see here. Uh, what is one product that Ken has seen at iCast that won best in show but fizzled when it went to the public market? I got that one. You go first. And if we come up with the same one, I'm going to say it right now, we'll see. I think we're going to come up with the same one, though. Well, I mean, it's easy to point to a lot of the hard and soft baits that have won and yeah. that have uh, shown up in bargain bins a few months later. And part of the problem there is that uh is that gimmicky wins at iCast gimmicks win <laughs> when, when you've got a sea of 100 or 150 different soft baits on a shelf uh the spider or the duck or the bat yeah kind of gets your attention and gets yeah. a lot of votes now i have never personally voted for a spider a duck or a bat yeah but a lot of people have enough to make those products win. So those are those are some easy ones. Uh, a Yeti bucket won one year for best fishing accessory or something like that. I mean, it was a bucket. Well, you but, haven't said the one that I was thinking of, Ken. I'm sure I'm I'm sure I'm familiar with it, but it is the Carolina rig rock. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> the sinkers that look like rocks. Yeah, that kind of fizzled. Yeah. That never took off. No. Well, you know, I guess if you look like a rock, it's natural, but it's not very natural for a rock to hop off the bottom <laughs> and, then, and plant itself. Again. I just remember me being the, the Carolina rig guy. I remember seeing that for, for, for the first time thinking, what in the world? And then it ended up winning best in show for accessory or something. I don't know what category it was. Probably it's, terminal tackle. Yeah. Um, and like, it never went anywhere. Yeah, it's 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 weird, uh, and that, that goes right back to the thing we were saying about gimmicky. You know, yeah. one of the things you have to do in a sea of hundreds of of entries is you have to stand out, and um, and that's why gimmicky wins. Let's take a look at the most boring lure uh, invented over the last twenty five years. Senko. Yes, the Senko is the most uh -huh. boring looking lure of the last twenty five years, and it's probably the best. Probably the best. Um, it, it has no chance at iCast. It does not have a prayer of winning at iCast unless the voters knew it had won a tournament right before then or unless the voters had all gotten a bag of them and knew how to fish them and took them out. Then it would have a chance. But since it took the Senko 
a few years to become popular. A bait like the Senko, which is a fabulous lure, obviously, has no chance at iCast. Yeah. All right, man. In your opinion, what has been the number one selling plastics color in history? Come on. Come on. Well, uh, let me qualify it. Since okay. about since the mid-80s, when this color was invented, it's green pumpkin. Green okay. pumpkin is more than 50% of the bass soft plastics market. More than 50% is green pumpkin. Uh, wow. But if, but if you want to go in history, uh, black would make a, a run at it for sure. Uh, yeah, green pumpkin has been around you know, forever. And, and green pumpkin's only been around since the, the mid to late 80s. Wow. And you know the story of green pumpkin, right? Or do we need uh, to tell the story of green pumpkin? Uh, real quick. All right, real quick. Uh, injection molding. That's how most guys make their soft plastics these days. You yeah. shoot the plastic into a mold. It cools. You open it up. You take them out. When you when you injection mold, uh, there is a, a, a period when you change from one color to another where the the – plastic is a, a mix of the two colors like if you've been shooting white or pearl and then you shoot black you're going to get uh, an ugly looking milky gray nasty looking bait that you probably throw away yeah well, one day in the mid to late 80s they were shooting uh, a brownish color they called pumpkin and the next color they were going to shoot after that was watermelon and and ordinarily they would throw that first integrate out they would just say oh this is garbage we're going to throw it in the box and turn it into black by adding more pigment later. They pulled it out and they said, whoa, look at this. And the folks <laughs> at Zoom Fish, which is not true of every company. And uh, they said, we're gonna, we're gonna take this thing out there and, and see how this thing does. And of course it did great. And, and so they introduced it as the combination of watermelon and pumpkin, which they decided to call green pumpkin. And uh, the rest is history. About 70% of Zoom's soft plastic sales, and I believe they are the number one soft plastic seller in, in the American bass market, about 70% of their soft plastics are green pumpkin. Wow. Yeah. That's good stuff. All right, man. The final thing uh, I want to talk, talk with you about is the anniversary date of the world record bass is today. And uh, just kind of throw us your thoughts about what today means and, and really about that whole world record situation, Ken. Well, of course, on June 2nd, 1932 in, in South Georgia, uh, George Perry and a buddy of his named Jack Page went out to the Okmulgee River uh, to a little oxbow. It was called Lake Montgomery, and they launched a little plywood boat. And uh, according to legend, they fished – hard they couldn't go work the fields on their farms because it was really wet that year but they fished hard taking turns with the one rod and reel they had taking turns with the one lure they had which was a creek chub fintail shiner and toward the end of the day perry saw an interesting disturbance near a stump made a cast hooked a bass that uh, he boated it weighed 22 pounds four ounces on certified uh, post office or general store scales when they got back to Helena, Georgia, uh, a short time later. Now, uh, that fish was then entered in the Field and Stream Big Fish Contest. Field and Stream later started keeping records of the biggest fish that had been entered in their contest, and uh, it became recognized as the world record a few years later. Uh, it is still recognized as the co-world record, along with the fish that Manabu Karita caught in 2009. But it's my opinion that the Perry fish was a fraud and it's my opinion that uh that it should be removed from the record books so we'll talk about that another time when we have a chance to do a <laughs> full-blown world record largemouth show we but, will but perry's fish is more than sketchy more 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 than sketchy all right we'll leave it at that that's a great tease there ken there you for go. people to tune in to the world record largemouth show uh, what did the the Karita, what did he catch that fish on? A bluegill. Live bait. Live bait, yeah. Live okay. bait, which is, which is, you know, 
we talked about this one before. That's why Karita didn't make a, a million dollars on the world record. He caught yeah. it on tackle from Japan. He caught it on live bait. He doesn't speak English. <laughs> My God, that, that's the textbook way not to make money on a world record largemouth bass. Is he a star in Japan, though? I think he was a star in Japan. I don't know that he's he's uh, maintained his stardom in Japan. One of the things Karita said after he caught that fish was that it was a part of a, a group of gigantic bass. He said his was not the largest fish in the school he saw. And he also said that he believed he could catch a bigger one and would catch a bigger one soon after. And, of course, that didn't happen. So uh, – uh, that that would have been really cool. That would have been a heck of a story yeah. if you were able to catch another one. Heck yeah. All right. Is it safe to say that sometime during either the month of June or July, we can do the world record shows? Absolutely. You know, we can right. do the world record show if you want to. Let's let's you and I get through the Bassmaster Classic. Yeah. And uh and, and we can either do it between the classic and iCast. Or we can do it after I cast, whatever you'd like to do. Today's the anniversary of the world record largemouth, and uh, July uh, 9th is the anniversary of the world record smallmouth. Which was caught where? Uh, Dale Hollow Lake on the Tennessee Kentucky right. border. It was That's caught right. in Kentucky waters in 1955 by David L. Hayes, who passed away uh, just last year at the age of 95. Wow. Cool stuff, man. I know the fans are fired up. I can't wait. For those two shows, those will be can't-miss shows, man. You know, right here over my shoulder, that is a replica of the world record smallmouth caught by David Hayes in 1955. That is a record of the world record largemouth supposedly caught by George Perry in 1932. So I've already got my props ready, Mark. <laughs> oh, man. We may have to do this sooner than... Uh we thought because I, i'm really really curious to hear the whole ken duke uh analyst the analyst of of what went down on this date many many years ago almost 100 years ago right is that right 89 years ago 80, yeah yeah 89 years ago all right do you think it'll be broken soon no nope, not gonna happen no, I, I do not i do not all right well, once again, that's a good tease. I want to know why. All right, man. Guess what, Ken? We made it through the entire show. Screens are not smoking. Things are not blowing up. We are golden, hopefully. Well, that, that just means everything's technologically okay on your end, Mark Jeffries. What about my end? I got, <laughs> I got blue and green flames coming out of my laptop. Oh, geez. Ken, as always, man, thank you for pitch hitting. For Matt, while well, he is down at Lake Amistad at Kurt Dove's camp. So uh, great stuff, man. Look forward to having you on. Uh, and, and we'll definitely get together next week in Fort Worth. Always a pleasure, my friend. Enjoy it so much. Thank you. All right, folks. Great stuff from Ken Duke. And uh, don't forget, tomorrow, back with day four, which is actually day three this week because of the holiday. Day four tomorrow, Frank Scalish. Let's see what Uncle Frank has in store for us on Thursday. Everybody out there, be safe. That's it. We're out of here. <laughs>